Hello, everybody. How are you doing today? Welcome, welcome. How's the home and garden show treating you? Not bad? You finding anything fun? My name is Russ Henry, and I'm the owner of Minnehaha Falls Landscaping. We're an all-organic landscaping company, pollinator-friendly landscaping company in South Minneapolis. In addition to bee lawns, which we're going to talk about today, we also make patios, walkways, retaining walls, fences, decks, you name it. We even have a remodeling company where we can come in and do interior remodeling as well. So today we're going to talk about bee lawns. Anybody here ever heard of a bee lawn before? Okay, good. We got some experienced folks in the crowd. This won't be your first time thinking about bee lawns. So I would be glad to take your questions as we go through this too. Feel free to give any questions that you have. Now oh, let's Okay, bee lawns help us savor and cultivate this deliciously interconnected world. Bees are really a lot like people. They're thinking about food and family all day long, right? I don't know about you, but that's like basically the only things I think about. My twins, I've got year and a half year old twins and, my, and food. So feeding them, feeding myself and, and uh, I think bees are basically thinking about the same stuff all day long. Bee lawns are critical for helping us restore productivity to the landscape. If we think about the landscape here in Minneapolis and the Twin Cities, before white settlers arrived here, this was unbroken wilderness. Anybody here been to the Boundary Waters? Yeah, you've seen unbroken wilderness up there where it's amazing, it's just wildlife. There's all the animals and the water is clean and it's rich with fish and all, there's bears and there's deer and everything crawling through and around the forest. Bee lawns can help us bring a little bit of that productivity back to our urban and suburban landscapes where we have removed all of the wildlife. And we need wildlife. We're gonna talk about why we need bees. So today we're gonna to talk about what is a bee lawn, why we want a bee lawn, and how to bee lawn. So let's jump right on in. There's three basic seed mixes with bee lawns. There's the clover mix, the yarrow mix, and the deluxe mix. The deluxe blends the clover and the yarrow mix together. It's my favorite, my favorite blend. Dutch white clover, who has Dutch white clover growing at home? Okay, everybody should have raised their hands because basically it's, it's all over the place. Almost everybody has it. Unless your yard is being treated with herbicides, then you might not have Dutch white clover. But if you do, you're lucky because Dutch white clover feeds 55 species of native bees. In addition, as it's growing, it puts nitrogen in the ground. The number one fertilizer that all plants need is what? Nitrogen. So if we've got a plant that's adding that to the ground as it's growing, hey, it's doing work for us. It's making our lives a little lower maintenance. And I love that about Dutch white clover. It's a little white flower in the lawn. You can't beat it. Dutch white clover will grow about ankle height. It's mowable. It's walkable. It's uh, drought resistant, highly drought resistant. It's a great plant to have around. Creeping thyme. OK, who's grown creeping thyme before? Okay, a few folks, good. Creeping thyme in the bee lawn seed mix will show up in those hot, sunny spots along the sidewalk, along the driveway. It'll uh, really thrive in those places where other plants don't do quite as well. It's beautiful little pink flower, hugs the ground as it grows, mowable and walkable. You're gonna find that all the plants in the bee lawn seed mix, uh, in the seed mixes are mowable, walkable, and drought resistant. Self-heal, okay, so I told you there's the three seed mixes. Self-heal is in all three of the seed mixes. And it's a beautiful purple blooming mint plant. Um, lots of bees love it. And I think it's just really smart to start having a few intentional purple flowers in the lawn because there's other purple flowers that show up that aren't intentional, and if we start enjoying the purple in our lawns, then we don't have to worry about those other ones. Fescue grass is the basis 
for all the Bilan seed mixes. It's the majority of the, of the seed in all the blends. And um, it's a no-mow grass, grows really well. This is a picture from just over uh, in South Minneapolis. Uh, you'll find fescue grass in almost every lawn seed mix sold in Minnesota from any reputable vendors. They're gonna have this as a part of the mix. And then it's in the bee lawn too, because it doesn't need to be mowed. It can be mowed, and it's totally walkable, but it doesn't need to be mowed. So it's, it makes an excellent addition to the bee lawn seed mix. And it's, uh, it's just a very easy grass to grow. It will grow in the sun, it will grow in the shade. It's a very easy grass to grow. One thing about it, it does have, you can see it's kind of a little bit of a clump former. Yeah. The question was, any certain variety of fescue? Well, there's Chewing's fescue, red fescue, and hard fescue are all going to be in any good fescue mix. They should have a, a blend of all three of those, Chewing's, red, and hard fescue. And the, the fescues that we're using in the Bilan seed mixes, this is an interesting point for anybody who might be a naturalist or really enjoys native plants. The fescue is a relative of the native fescues, but the fescues in the seed mixes are actually European fescues. The fescues that grow, uh, the native fescues for Minnesota are not mowable, and they're kind of walkable, but not really because they form even more of a clump. They don't really spread like the, the European fescues do. So uh, when you buy the native bee lawn seed mixes, it's important that I think everybody understand now we don't sell the seed mixes, we, we install them, but I really want my clients to know what they're getting into. So when it says native Bilan seed mix on it, keep in mind that's just the flowers in the mix that are native. The fescue in it is still a European fescue. If you wanted to go with a 100% Minnesota native Bilan, instead of fescue, you would use buffalo grass. You've got buffalo grass, we talked about it, didn't we? Yes. You have another question. Drought tolerance and that and everything you've talked about. Drought tolerance, yep. Drought tolerance of fescue is very high. Drought tolerance of buffalo grass is even higher. Uh, however, compared to Kentucky bluegrass and perennial ryegrass, which are the normal, normal standard lawn grasses, um, it's extremely drought tolerant. These are extremely drought tolerant compared to that. Kentucky bluegrass at 80 degrees soil temp will go dormant much above that and it dies, the Kentucky bluegrass. So in addition to uh, being not very strong on its own uh, and, and therefore you're not really drought tolerant, because of that it's also actually quite susceptible to grubs, regular lawn grass. Anybody had grubs problems? Okay, B big bare patches in the lawn, yep. And, and grubs will come in to areas where I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a connection for us here. Grubs uh, love lawns without much life in them, OK? So if you have a lawn, a soil system that has a lot of fungi, then that soil system will also have a whole lot of nematodes. Nematodes are microscopic worms that swim through the thin film of water that surrounds every soil particle. And as they're swimming around down there, they carry with them on their bodies a uh, bacteria called milky spore. And when they find a grub, they crawl inside the grub and they destroy the grub while performing part of their life cycle in there. And in the process, they control the grubs. The, the thing that destroys them is the milky spore. It kills the grub. So in a healthy soil system, you're not gonna have grubs. Now, how do you have a healthy soil system? Polyculture. Well, what's that mean? It's the opposite of a monoculture, right? Polyculture means you have multiple types of plants growing in a single space. Simple. What's a bee lawn? It's a polyculture. So a bee lawn is gonna be injecting sugar into the ground all season long because these drought tolerant plants can emit sugars through, actually all plants can emit sugars through their roots, but the drought tolerant plants can do it all season long when as they emit these sugars, they're feeding fungi all the way along. I'm getting way ahead of myself in this discussion because I love that question. But, uh, and we're gonna come around to see some pictures of this fungi working as well. Let's keep going with these plants. Yak yarrow. 
Who's got yarrow growing in the, yep. Yarrow is a weed that grows all over the place. It's a native plant, feeds butterflies, feeds bees, feeds moths. Let's take a moment real quick and talk about why are moths and butterflies important? Is it just because they're so cute? Because they are. Anybody else know why they might be important? Anybody here heard of keystone species? Okay. A keystone species is a species that ties the whole ecosystem together. Just like the keystone in a bridge that allows the whole bridge to hold up, keystone species are those species that really hold the whole environment together. So what's a, what are the keystone species in Minnesota? What are they doing? Well, back to moths and butterflies. Moths and butterflies make caterpillars, right? Caterpillars in the spring are the number one food source for all these animals in Minnesota. Not all of them, but almost all of them. So all your songbirds and then lizards and snakes and frogs and turtles, even mammals, mice, gophers, um, uh, all, squirrels, all kinds of animals, even bears will eat caterpillars. Bears, when the tent caterpillars come out, bears can eat 20 pounds of those a day. So caterpillars are extremely important food source. Just to give you one example, chickadees, right? The cute little songbird chickadees, right? We love them. Every early summer, mom and dad chickadee are raising two or three babies for three or four weeks. In that time, how many caterpillars do mom and dad got to bring back per baby? Anybody? Any guesses? I heard 2,000 up here, and that's close. It's 3,000. 3,000 caterpillars per baby. So if they've got three babies, they've got to find 9,000 caterpillars. That means that the tree species in Minnesota, the tree and shrub species that support the most number of caterpillars are the what? The keystone species that are holding the whole environment together. What are the keystone tree and shrub species for Minnesota? Oak is one of them. And oak is actually the number two. It's very important. Can support over 300 species of moths and butterflies. But the number one plants for supporting moths and butterflies in Minnesota are, drum roll please, willows. There are 21 native species of willows. I'm sorry, but weeping willow is not one of the natives. That's a non-native plant. However, the 21 species of native willows include trees and shrubs, something for every different type of environment from sun to shade, from uh, dry to wet. So uh, think about including some keystone species. Other keystone species in Minnesota include birch, maple, pine, uh, poplar, ash. And ash, that, that actually brings up an interesting point, right? Because ash trees themselves can feed 284 species of native insects in Minnesota. But what's going on with the ash trees right now? Emerald ash borer, which is a non-native insect, a beetle coming over that has moved in through our native ash trees, doesn't have any competition here, so it can just kind of wipe them out. And I've talked to the state's leading experts about this problem that's facing so many of my landscape clients. And it turns out that maybe one in 10,000 trees of ash trees will survive in the wild. And that's because they're gonna be in such healthy soil systems that they're gonna be able to make very strong plant secondary metabolites. Uh-oh, I just got nerdy. Uh, plant secondary metabolites are sap, you know, uh, chemicals that the plants can make. And when they're in very healthy soil, they can make such chemicals that to keep any insect that they don't want at bay, including the emerald ash borer. So that's not likely to happen to mo with most of our trees, especially in an urban or suburban environment where the soil is compacted and we don't have a really healthy soil system. So let me just finish this thought and I'll come back. So what I would say is to what I do say to all my clients, I do about 300 consultations a year on site with clients. And what I say to them when they have ash trees is, let's think about removing and replacing. Why? Because if we were gonna inject that ash tree or do a soil drench of insecticide, 
in order to kill that emerald ash borer, we're going to be killing 284 native insect species along with that. And that is dangerous. That's very dangerous because included in those are bees and butterflies. So you'll hear the people who sell the insecticide treatments say, oh yeah, these are, uh, these are inoculations and these inoculations don't hurt bees. Well, you and me, we all know, especially with everything we've been through in the last few years, that an inoculation is a biological agent that's introduced into a living organism so that organism can create uh, the uh, immune response to deal with that, with that biological agent. However, that's not what's going on. We're not inoculating trees, we're using chemotherapy on trees. And we know that with chemotherapy, that kills almost everything except for the host. Well, what we're doing when we inject ash trees with emmenbectin benzoate or neonicotinoid is we're basically giving a death sentence to several hundred species, or a couple hundred species, several uh, dozen of which, 200 of which are generalists. That means that they don't require the ash tree. If the ash wasn't there, they'd just go over to a birch or a poplar or a maple and find their home there. But if the ash is there, they may just go eat from that and then they're gonna get poisoned. And they, if they're a bee, they may go eat some of that wind-borne pollen that's sitting on the tree before it takes off and they'll bring that pollen back to the, to the hive or to the nest to feed to the babies, to the larvae. So when ash trees are in bloom, up to 25% of the pollen in the larval chambers is from ash trees. Very important that we don't use any pesticides in the ash trees because they're a buffet for wildlife. Instead, we remove and replace. I say, let's do the replacements first before we remove so that we get that little whip of a tree growing in the shade of the ash that we're gonna have to take down. And then once the ash starts losing its bark on the upper branches, that's when it's time to really call in the arborist and have the tree come down. We started that with yarrow. Did you still have a question? Oh, okay, so good questions. Are there tolerant varieties or, or resistant varieties of ash trees? And can you physically catch the bugs so that they don't uh, infest the tree? Uh, no and no. Sorry. There, there have been, uh, unlike with elm, which now we do have Dutch elm disease resistant elm trees that we can plant that'll get us that glorious 100 foot canopy of elm again. Um, there are no more, uh, there, there has not yet been developed an ash tree that can, that is resistant to the emerald ash borer. It's very hard to resist a, an invasive insect. Um, and then as far as trapping them, if anybody has in, in the world has had success with that, I would love to hear about it. I don't think it's possible because uh, the beetles can, can move through and lay the eggs and the larvae go under the, the tree bark and I don't know that there's any way to stop that. Okay. Blue-eyed grass. This is the final plant in the in the Bilan seed mixes, and it's not really the strongest plant in the world. It will. It is not drought tolerant. It is walkable and mowable, but it will only really thrive in the sunny, wet spots. So if you have a, an area down by the lake, then uh, this might be uh, this might show up in your Bilan seed mix. It might start sprouting. Then we got our freebies. Okay, so. Those seeds that we just, those plants we just talked about come in the bee lawn seed mix. And if you buy a bee lawn seed mix, say from Twin City Seed, which is where we get ours, uh, then it's gonna have those plants in it. However, we already probably have some plants in our lawns that are already feeding bees. The white clover we talked about, that's one of the seeds, but it's also probably in our lawns already. And then, anybody ever seen this rare plant before? Yeah. Hard to find these, right? So dandelions are great for feeding not just bees in the early part of the season, but also for feeding moths and butterflies and ants and beetles. Lots of little creatures love the dandelion. There is a native dandelion from Minnesota. It's not the one that's all over the place, uh, but the dandelion Taraxacum officiale that's all over the place is um, naturalized species. So while it's non-native, there are non-native species that we think of as invasive, 
And then there are those that we think of as naturalized. The naturalized species are here to stay and they're feeding wildlife now. They're a very important part of the ecosystem. Once they came in, the, the uh, creatures already here started using them immediately. The, the invasive species like buckthorn and uh, garlic mustard and such, only used by a few native animal and insect species, and yet they can proliferate and take, out, and take off. So we're watching out for those invasives. Okay, this might be controversial, but I love Creeping Charlie. And I love it because it's low, it's drought resistant, it's mowable, it's walkable, and the bees go for it. So I see bumblebees and honeybees on it. I encourage you to watch those purple flowers sprouting up in your lawn this year and see who's over there gathering nectar. See if, there's, if there might be some pollinators on it having a bite to eat. Now, because Charlie is, has all these virtues of being walkable and mowable and drought resistant, feeding bees, well, and because nobody likes a creep, we gave him a new name. He's Good Time Charlie now. And Good Time Charlie is invited to all the garden parties because he works as a ground cover. Charlie works as a ground cover up underneath larger perennials and shrubs. Basically, the only place I don't like Charlie is in my strawberry patch. But other than that, I want Charlie up everywhere, growing up underneath shrubs and trees and, and uh, making life easier because when Charlie is growing, you know that because it's drought resistant, it's going to be adding sugar to the ground all season long, feeding fungi, and that fungi will also feed my trees and shrubs and perennials. Wood sorrel. Who's ever tried wood sorrel before? Uh-huh. It's a beautiful, yummy, lemon zesty flavor. It has a heart-shaped leaf. Uh, it looks like a clover with the heart-shaped leaf, and it's kind of a bright chartreuse green with the, with the gold, bright gold flower. Uh, this makes it look bigger than it is. It's just a tiny little flower on there and uh, tastes very zesty like lemon. So add some, add some to your salads, some wood sorrel. Chickweed, what I'm pointing out with all of these weeds here is that just because a plant is a weed doesn't mean it doesn't have some benefit. I mean, if it's mowable and walkable and feeding bees, hey, maybe just let it stay in the bee lawn. And don't, don't worry about getting out those herbicides. We know that herbicides not only kill weeds, but they also kill soil fungi. And they harm and sometimes kill bees. So we want to avoid using herbicides. Basically, avoid, my, my rule is I avoid any isides. The isides are not invited to the garden party anymore. So, herbicides, insecticides, rodenticides, you name it, I'm not, I'm not using them in my gardens because they all have unintended consequences far beyond what we're trying to use them for. So they're, they're very dangerous tools. I think of it as um, kind of like uh, using, uh, using dynamite to fish. Anybody ever seen somebody do that? It's not, a good, not good for the lake. But you get a lot of fish, right? Still, what a horrible idea if everybody did that. We would have no more lakes and no more fish. This is what we're doing. We're, we're kind of just putting poison in the environment, saying, oh, this can go all over the place to the neighbors, to everybody else, doesn't matter. It can kill as many bees as it possibly could, it doesn't matter. That's something we really, as a culture, need to rethink. Scylla is a plant that, who has Scylla in their line? Yeah, it's so pretty, isn't it? That blue every spring. Now, Scylla will, it is starting to invade into woodlands. I haven't seen it. I've heard tell of this, uh, not into prairies, but into woodlands. So it is a non-native. I don't plant Scylla anymore, but I also don't bother pulling it up if it's out there. It's feeding bees. So if you're lucky enough, I think, to have Scylla in your lawn, I say leave it, add some clover, let it all feed the bees. But maybe think about not planting plants that, you know, intentionally anymore that are going to, that are known to invade into the woodlands. Now we can start maximizing our bee lawns. And so that's where we might add in some more native plant species that aren't going to be necessarily the heaviest hitters for feeding hundreds of bee species, but they're going to feed some and they might feed us and they're going to help the soil health. So wild strawberries tucked into the edge of the lawn. 
You can walk on the wild strawberry a little bit, but you'd probably tuck it in here and there, and then it can stretch and grow out from there. Prairie pussy toes. Who's ever grown prairie pussy toes? It's the cutest, isn't it? It's such an adorable plant. Hugs the ground, only that tall, the foliage. Really super tight, silvery foliage. And then the little flower stalks come up about four or five inches tall. Very cute. I love prairie pussy toes. And very easy to grow once you get it grown. You can find prairie pussy toes from plugs at any of the Minnesota native plant nurseries. And so help me out if I miss any of them. That's Outback Nursery, Prairie Restoration, Landscape Alternatives, Minnesota Native Landscapes, Prairie Moon. Did I miss anybody? Check out those nurseries. There's some awesome Minnesota Native plant nurseries out there. Violets, probably most of us have violets somewhere in the landscape. They're excellent. There are, I don't know how many species of violets, but there are a number of Minnesota Native species. I think I've got five different Native species of violets in my, in my Minneapolis food forest. Um, and when you see violets come in, just know that they're great. They're feeding bees. They are edible for people as well. Okay, so why, why should we grow a bee lawn? Besides the fact of that productivity in the landscape and, and how we love bees so much and we'd love to have them back around us, we know that one in three bites of the food that we eat come from bees. I don't know about you, but I'm not really willing to give up a third of the food that I eat. Especially, okay, now, I learned this one recently. It's, it's not just the delicious and really important fruits and vegetables. It's also beefsteak. I'm not living without beefsteak because the cows have to eat the alfalfa and the alfalfa isn't growing unless the bees are coming around to, to pollinate it. So if you like steak or hamburgers, eh, you might like the bees. 4,000 species of native bees in Minnesota. In the U.S., excuse me, in the U.S. There's 4,000 in the U.S. And in the world, 20,000 species of native bees. And one in four, 25% of those bees are at risk of extinction. Extinction is forever. There's over a million species worldwide at risk of extinction right now. I want my one and a half year old twins to grow up in a world with monarch butterflies, my friends. Monarch butterflies and all the rest of the animals. We've got to think about how we can make our landscapes more productive so that our kids and grandkids can enjoy this beautiful earth. Many benefits coming from the bee lawns. Let's talk about aesthetics, maintenance, and habitat. I think it's really impressive to the neighbors if you're not out there wasting money on the lawn. We've got kind of a changing aesthetic happening, right? So I'll tell you, in these 300 consultations I do on site every year at people's houses, oh, maybe 299 of them say to me, Russ, it has to be low maintenance. Whatever we do has to be low maintenance. I am not seeing a new generation of and women being raised to go out there and mow the lawn every Saturday and enjoy themselves and, and think that that's a satisfying life. That things are changing. And so the new aesthetic, the new, uh, look of the neighborhoods is going to be a little more wild. There are cities in the U.S. that have really wild looks, even throughout their suburbs. Anybody here ever been to Spokane? Yeah, Spokane, Washington. The giant trees, the giant pine trees, ponderosa pines everywhere. Every yard is filled with these enormous ponderosa pines that they don't, they try not to cut them down when they're building the houses. And then you get this forest, in the, you know, your, your neighborhood is a forest. We can have that again. We have, a, we have a bit of a forest here in the city, and we can always improve on that, especially in the under layers of canopy, adding more perennials and shrubs to help the rest of that taller canopy grow really well. I think, it's, I think it says good things about you and your decision making. If you're out there deciding to support bees, spend more time with your family, not introduce poisons, not waste your time mowing, not waste your time water in the lawn. I think this says good things about people who make those kind of decisions. It's, it shows a certain amount of communal and ecological intelligence and a valuing of, of the ecology and of the community. Low maintenance, and we talked about that. These lawns, these bee lawns, no mow, no fertilizing. Uh, weeding, hardly ever have to weed these things. You can mow them if you want. You don't have to. 
No irrigation. What a deal. Wow, uh, that's a much better prospect for most of my clients than a Kentucky bluegrass lawn, which if we think about it just for a second, Kentucky bluegrass is so weak that it takes an entire industry to prop it up. Clover doesn't require an industry. It's already out there in our lawns. Let's have, I, I like solutions for my clients that don't mean they have to spend money with my company the rest of their lives. If I was selling them on pesticide irrigated lawns, they're gonna have to spend money with me forever in order to keep that thing looking good, me or some other company like it. But if I sell somebody a bee lawn, three years from now, they're on their own, they're doing life, life is great. They might call me up just to tell me how great life is, but they probably don't need to spend more money on the lawn. Habitat, here in Minneapolis, a man named James Wolfen did a study while he was a University of Minnesota student. And in that study, which he did in Minneapolis parks, he found that the white clover will feed 55 species of bees in Minneapolis. In addition, when he added in the creeping thyme and self-heal, we got another 10 species coming in. So 65 species of native bees fed, and that's just in Minneapolis. James, the researcher, says that outside of Minneapolis, you probably get even more species coming to these because of the kind of limitations of the city. Uh, James works now at Twin City Seed, where I buy my seed mix from. And so we know it's, I love having the science. You know, folks will flash around that word, science. well, the science says, the science says this, so you better get in line because the science, the science. Well, what is the science? Here, here's this science. Science is a process, and the scientific process showed us that clover and these other plants feed bees. Now there's the science. So how are we gonna do this? How do we get a bee lawn growing? Well, health always starts in the soil. But what is healthy soil? Okay, I'm gonna get real nerdy here again, so bear with me, okay? These are pictures from my microscope. We got dirt on top and soil on the bottom. These are magnified 400 times both. And on top, this is what I find in a farm field that's been treated and or a lawn that's been treated. And then on the bottom, this is a typical garden soil, uh, something you might find in a compost pile or a garden or in the forest. So up on top here, we see all these shiny pieces in there. Those are pieces of sand, silt, and clay. And when water runs through a soil profile like that, it just takes all those pieces of sand, silt, and clay and compacts them down on top of one another, forming a compaction layer in the soil that then water cannot penetrate, roots cannot penetrate, and it really limits plant growth. If this was a moving image, we'd see that the tiniest pieces in there are shimmering back and forth. And those are bacteria that a nerd like myself says are unaggregated bacteria. They haven't yet aggregated up. This is what we would call an immature soil. Any soil that's treated with synthetics is going to become an immature soil because the synthetics will kill all of the very vulnerable microbiology that is in the soil. Now, over time, if this soil was left to rest and, and nobody added more poisons to it, what would happen is those bacteria, they have a sticky substance on the outside of their bodies. It's called glomulin and they start to stick together around pieces of sand, silt, and clay and organic matter in the soil. And they start to eat that organic matter over and over again, processing it, creating these beautiful chocolate brown, humic acid filled micro aggregates. So this is when the bacteria aggregate the soil and they're taking, they're grabbing hold essentially with their, with their sticky skin, grabbing hold of the organic matter so they can eat that. But in the process, all the sand, silt, and clay gets stuck up in there too. And now because that sand, silt, and clay is stuck in there, we can still see some shiny pieces in here, but not anywhere near as much. So now when water runs through this, it's gonna flow through here. This soil is like a sponge. And that's how we want our soils so that our plants are healthy in that sponge-like soil. And especially because then they'll have enough water. They'll have enough nutrient to get out of that soil. This is a nematode, microscopic worm, mortal enemy of the grubs, carries with it on its body the milky spore bacteria inside the body of the grubs. And that's what controls grubs in a healthy organic lawn. You get a lot of this in a bee lawn because of the polyculture effect. 
Now here's what happens over even more time, you get just really good aggregation happening. I'm such a nerd that when I look under a soil microscope and I see this kind of thing happening, oh, I get excited. I'll call my wife. Oh, you can't believe the soil fungi I just saw. This is incredible. <laughs> it's true. Now what we got happening here, all this beautiful aggregation is leading to fungi growing between the microaggregates, pushing them apart and holding them in place. And this is the most sponge-like texture that your soil can become. Now, when the air and water come, they can flow right through here. The, the water might have contaminants from the surface that it's bringing down in, and those contaminants will get eaten up by the bacteria and the fungi. They'll get transformed. The nutrition, then, that is being mined out of these aggregates by the fungi will be shipped along these tubes, through these tubes, directly to the plants. These tubes are called hyphae, and thousands of them form together to create what we can see on a visual scale. We call mycelium, the white threads of fungi moving through the soil. Well, on an individual level, this is what they look like, and these, will connect, these hyphae will connect to plant roots. As the, as the fungi is mining the soil for nutrition and water, it's shipping that that nutrition of water along its hyphae back into the plant. In exchange, the plant is so grateful, it's making all this sugar and it's just that sugar out in the soil. About 40% of the sugars that plants make, they emit through their roots in order to feed fungi and bacteria. 60%, the rest of that sugar, they're using to make their own bodies. But 40%, now, would you be willing to take 40% of all the sugar and uh, you know maybe all the cookies on your plate and give them to somebody else? That's pretty generous of you, but if they're gonna come along and give you everything you need to live, hey, it's nothing, right? So this fungi can go out in the environment and gather phosphorus and potassium and cobalt and cadmium and all the, all the nutrients and the water that the plants are gonna need. Up to a thousand times more capacity to get nutrition and water out of the soil when the plants are connected in a mycorrhizal relationship with fungi. Here's that beautiful photosynthetic process happening where carbon dioxide and water are combined within the plant using the power of sunlight to create sugars. And those sugars are feeding the fungi in the soil, growing all of this fungi that's connected to the plants and then connecting all of the plants in a web, connecting them together so that these mama plants are connected to their little baby plants, and the little baby plants can't get any sunlight down there, so mama is sending them sugars and water and all the nutrition that they need through the fungal network into the baby plant. Dr. Susan Simard's work really highlighted that. She's an amazing uh, for, uh, uh, a forester. She grew up in a forestry family, and she's also a professor in Canada who helps the uh, Canadian Forestry Service learn how to manage forests for health. The soil food web is the web of life that is coming and stemming and all based on all of that organic matter and sugar that the plants are putting in the ground, the bacteria and fungi growing from there creating this enormous mass of life underground that then all of these other creatures can eat from and grow off of. Nematodes, microarthropods, amoebae, and ciliates, all sorts of wonderful creatures down underground taking nutrition off of, the, off of the fungi, off of the bacteria, and they're eating it and they're leaving waste behind. This is another way that plants get their nutrition by all of these, you know, the, the insects and the amoebae eating all this nutrition all day long, leaving waste behind on the roots and the roots soaking that right up. Okay, so let's just assume by now that bee lawns are a good thing, right? Bee lawns are great. So then, how do we do them? Well, there are two methods for transitioning. We have a rapid transition method and what we call a moderate transition method. So the rapid transition method, it's a lot of work. It's a big investment up front, but it pays off instantly. Okay, so we're removing the existing turf. This is a sod cutter. That's a machine that turns a man into a mule. And so you might want to either have a company do it or use a uh, machine sod cutter, the gas powered sod cutter that can take it up and you roll up your sod. Then you come along and you aerate. Who's had aeration done on their lawn? Okay, you're going to want to aerate after you remove that sod and that's going to help you 
because the sod's not in the way, you're gonna penetrate pretty deep with that aerator and you're gonna really add a lot of air, break through the compaction layer that's in almost all of our lawns. Then we're gonna seed. Now the seed mix for bee lawns, we're gonna use five pounds per thousand square feet is the general rule. So on the, you'll see here that there's two times that we're seeding. So in the first seeding, which is gonna go, end up below the compost, this seeding gets two and a half pounds per thousand square feet. And then we add compost about a half inch. We wanna use a leaf mold compost. And we use the leaf mold compost because it has a lot of available phosphorus, which is gonna help the seeds sprout. We need that phosphorus to help the seeds sprout. I get my leaf compost from Kern Landscape Resources in St. Paul, but you could literally just make a pile of leaves and let them turn to dirt, and that's gonna be the perfect compost for seeding any lawn. Okay, so we have removed the sod, aerated, seeded, composted. Now the other two and a half pounds per thousand square feet goes down. So now you've made a sandwich, right? Where you've got this really nice fluffy soil underneath, seed, then compost, and then seed again on top. And then we use a blanket, seed blanket. We use a biodegradable wood fiber based seed blanket. No plastic, no nets. The nets catch birds. When you see that netted stuff around in the landscape, that stuff's, I'm gonna use this word, that stuff's evil. Because if you've ever seen a beautiful songbird wrapped up in that, unable to escape, and died because of it, you change your mind about it, you'd never use that stuff again, okay? So we use the netless wood fiber-based blanket. It's called Futera. And then we roll that out, use some sod staples to plug it in. And then you water, water, water. Water should be based on air temps. If it's 90 degrees when you're doing one of these, you don't want to let up on the water. You're going to water six times a day, probably, if it's 90 degrees. Okay, so you're just really watering. Now, that watering is going to last for about two months while this gets established. Once the clover is up to about two inches, you can cease watering, and you can taper it off before then. But at about two inches, you can stop your watering. And that's really the last time you'll ever have to water your bee lawn. The hottest drought that Minnesota is going to get, you can have a drought all season long, the, the bee lawn is still gonna be green. So this is how you achieve instant rapid transition. When you do this after about two weeks, first the grass pokes up through that blanket and this is what you start seeing right away. Then after a few months, the clover comes up over the top of the grass and now it looks like a field of clover in there. And mind you, this was during a drought that this came up. Now, one year into transition, I'd expect it to look like this. Again, a field of clover. If you use one of the mixes that doesn't have the clover in it, like the native mix, it's gonna have much more of a grassy look to it. You'll see a lot more grass. And two years in, again here, horrible drought happening. All the neighbor's lawns were you know, dusty brown. And then this is what our, uh, our client's lawn looked like. This is a bee lawn here that is only fescue and thyme. This one's three years in. When you limit the amount of species to only fescue and thyme, you can create a cultivated look, maybe a slightly more you know, refined look. Uh, however, this client weeded a lot to get there. They were out there weeding a lot to get this to establish. And here's a real, real big hint. Whenever you're gonna weed in a lawn, seed right afterward, weed and seed. Seed with the plants you like, right after you've done, you're done pulling your weed. Seed right in that spot, because then you're gonna get soy, uh, seed to soil contact. Some of that seed's gonna go down into the ground. Um, and it, and another, another really good trick is to seed immediately after rain, or excuse me, immediately before rain falls. If you seed before rain falls, the rain's gonna help you drive some of that seed down, make seed to soil contact, and give it the first moisture that it needs. Okay, now let's talk about our moderate transition. Let's say you're not, you're not sure about it or you don't have the budget or the time to go in and go whole hog and rip it all up, start all fresh. Well, you can take your existing lawn and transition it to a bee lawn, leaving the existing lawn in place. What you do is you aerate and overseed and maybe add some organic fertilizer three times per year for three years. If you've done this three times per year for three years, you will have a bee lawn at the end. You're also going to have Kentucky bluegrass in that lawn still. It won't go away. The bee lawn's not going to kill out the existing lawn, but it will compete with it in such a way that it's going to be mostly clover coming up in your lawn. 
the three times per year that you're going to want to do this around the beginning of the season in, in April. Um, we're looking for a dry time that we can send the aerators out because you don't want to send the aerators over wet soil. It'll compact the soil. That's doing the opposite of what we're trying to do with those aerators. So we'll look for a dry time in the spring. If we don't have a dry time in the spring, skip the spring aeration, okay? Do a little seeding and then late summer, around the middle of August and around the middle of September. Those two seedings, this one, some of this late summer is gonna sprout in the fall and some of this fall seeding is gonna sprout next spring. And so if you do that three times per year for three years, you're gonna have a really strong, robust bee lawn come in. Organic fertilizer, let me just say one quick word about organic fertilizer. Let us all eschew, never again use, water-soluble fertilizers. Water-soluble fertilizers are the real problem. Not synthetic versus organic, because the trick is that a lot of organic fertilizers are also water-soluble. What you wanna have is an organic fertilizer that is non-water-soluble, why? Because if you're putting water-soluble fertilizer down, about 90% of what you're putting down is just gonna go into local waterways. It's gonna bring that nutrition there, feed bacteria, which are gonna take all the oxygen out of the water, gonna kill all the fish. Okay, this is why we have impaired waterways in Minnesota. This is why 86% of the lakes in southern Minnesota are unfishable and unswimmable by Minnesota Pollution Control Agency standards because we're putting all kinds of synthetic fertilizer onto our farms and it's running off into the waterways. Instead, we use an organic fertilizer that's non-water soluble. When it's non-water soluble, that means something has to eat it before the plants can eat it. That's all that means. That means that our organic fertilizer we're putting down, this stuff, the bacteria has to eat it and transform it into soil, into nutrition for the, for the plants before the plants get it. And that's good. That means you're feeding soil first. You always wanna feed soil and not plants. You're feeding plants directly, that means you're killing soil, and killing soil opens yourself up as a grower to all kinds of problems. Moderate transition looks like this after two years. This is a transition space that's still mowed, but we got clover coming up in it. This is just a real standard looking kind of a thing, right? We see a lot of this in our lawns. A few years in, the moderate transition starts to get a little bit more clover. The self heal is starting to grow here. And you can see the Kentucky bluegrass, because this was in a drought, not doing so well, but the fescue is still green. So we got some brown and some green in this picture. That's gonna happen with the moderate transition. And then five years in, you start to get more fescue, a little bit more green, luscious environment. And uh, boy, I just love that self heal. It's such a pretty little plant. Prunella vulgaris, they call that. Now conditions will help you, dis will help figure out, will entirely figure out what will grow where, okay? So you might put one, the same seed mix down in a sunny spot and in a shady spot, and it'll look different in both spaces. So in the sun, you're gonna get a lot more, a lot more clover, and in the shade, you're gonna have a little more of the fescue mix coming out, showing itself. In the part sun, part shade, it's kind of a, a blend of both in there. Okay, to mow or not to mow? Well, if we're gonna mow, because you know, sometimes you gotta keep it low, mowing can also, help uh, eliminate weed trees that are trying to grow up, woody plants trying to grow up in the lawn. So first, if you have a bee lawn, the first thing you want to do if you're going to mow, walk through, kick the grass, scare off the bees and the butterflies, because we're not setting traps, right? We don't want to bring them all in and then chop them all up. Then we're only really going to mow when and where we need to. We're going to limit mowing to where we need to. And we'll see some examples of that. And we'll also look at some mowing special patterns. And let's talk about no mow may. No mow may was invented in England. England is north or south or even to us. Anybody? North, much further north. Like middle of Canada kind of north, right? Their summer starts later than ours. Their no mow may is our no mow April. If you want to protect bees and pollinators in the lawn in the early part of the season when nothing else is blooming, do not mow in April. But in May, what's blooming in Minnesota? Like everything, right? 
you got all the fruit trees and shrubs and perennials starting to bloom, all kinds of things blooming in Minnesota in May. So the bees have lots of food. If you need to mow in May, don't worry about it. Now, if somebody says to me, yeah, but oh, what, about, what about a no mow lawn? Hey, absolutely. If you want to be no mow ever, I'm your guy. I will be your, I will go out there to the city council and defend you for doing that. But you might want to make it easier on your neighbors by just having a few patterns that you mow in. Make it look intentional. Make it so that it doesn't look like the county's about to come and take over. So just, you know, mow the edge. A five foot wide swath at the front makes it look intentional. The neighbors know, oh, oh yeah, that's still on purpose. Bob's not ruining my property value. He's just growing out a bee lawn and doing something special. You might even put a little sign in here, say, oh, okay, yeah, no, that's a bee lawn. Okay, now we know what's going on. You might mow a path through it. That can look really lovely, very intentional. Or make yourself a big giant island in the middle with the bee lawn in the middle and mowing around the edges. Here's a, an example just from Egan, one of our sites where the client wanted a new garden. We use the bee lawn seed mix as a low maintenance ground cover in the garden. That's gonna help these trees grow their entire life. There's a few perennials that are getting started in here too, and they're just getting bigger every year. The bee lawn helps trees, shrubs, and perennials grow much faster. Okay, I just stole this picture off the internet. I didn't do that. That's like super creative, right? You could be creative with it. The, the point is, add a little bit of flair. If you're gonna be out there mowing, think about ways you can change it up so it's not just you know, the golf course out in front. Okay, now, no matter whether you have a regular lawn or a bee lawn, these rules apply, okay? Never mow shorter than three inches. In a bee lawn, if you want your self heal to bloom, really you don't want to mow shorter than about four and a half inches, okay? And that can be challenging. Uh, three inches or shorter, and any shorter than three inches, and you start to damage the health of the plant. Keep it in mind that the plants are using their grass blade to the sides with. They're catching sunlight. They're feeding themselves using that grass blade. Without it, they can't have food. Sharpen, dull mower blades are the worst thing I see out there. Let's imagine the top of this is the a grass blade magnified greatly. And we come along with a clean mower blade, we make a clean cut on that. We come along with a dull mower blade, it's going to grab and snag and tear the whole top of that grass. So if you walk through your lawn, you see the little tips, looks like uh, like they're all little fried at the end, that's because your mower blade is, is dull. In a regular size Minneapolis lawn, you need to sharpen your blade three times a year if you're mowing weekly. And nobody does that. So don't feel bad if you're part of the nobody that does that. But if you have a bigger lawn, I mean, we sharpen our blades for our lawns that we mow every day because you have to have a sharp blade. Otherwise, you're doing damage over the whole lawn and that can be hard to recover. Same thing goes for never cutting off more than a third of leaf blade height at any one time. So you and the family go on vacation for three weeks in May and you come back in June and the lawn's like, you know, you're using the machete to get to the garage. Well, you're gonna wanna take that down in increments or you're gonna kill it. If you cut off more than a third of the leaf blade height of any plant, you're likely to kill that plant. Now here is an example of using the bee lawn seed mix as a ground cover. This is only one year apart. This is over on Nokomis Avenue in Minneapolis. You can see we planted this uh, prairie meadow in the front of their, their house here with, we've got rain gardens built in, rain gardens in the boulevard, and we seeded the whole area. This is immediately after planting. We seeded with the clover bee lawn seed mix. This is one year later. So in one year, we got complete coverage of the ground. That's what you want to achieve with your plantings. Complete coverage of the ground in one year and using the bee lawn seed mix as a ground cover can really help you do that. A few little freebies I'm gonna throw in here at the end. If you wanna bring monarchs around to your bee lawns, have a pollinator pocket garden, include especially, we all know we should have common milkweed in there, some kind of milkweed growing in there because that's the habitat for the monarch butterflies. Joe pieweed, a, a very, uh, one of their favorite nectar plants, but their absolute favorite nectar plant is meadow blazing star. And I don't mean prairie blazing star, which is a good plant too. I mean meadow blazing star. Meadow blazing star before, if it's in bloom, when we bring it onto a job site to plant it, before we even dig the hole to get it in the ground, the butterflies show up. That's how attractive it is. And that's every time it's, it's, 
it's spooky how good it is at attracting butterflies. So meadow blazing star. Now, hummingbirds. Let's say you want to bring the hummingbirds around. We need to keep in mind that because we don't have sap suckers going around making holes in the trees in the early spring anymore, very few sap suckers left. The hummingbirds, as they migrate north, rely on those sap sucker holes to get the uh, to, to uh, get nutrition out of the tree, to get the sap flowing out of the tree. And so they are um, because they're not there anymore. We need to get out there in the early part of the season with as many red flowers as we can. The earliest blooming red flower you're going to be able to get out in Minnesota is if you plant annual flowers inside in the in the winter and then get them out immediately in the spring. So that would be applying to this uh, tropical salvia. That The hummingbirds absolutely love it. You could do that with this. And then the scarlet drop mar honeysuckle is an excellent vine for the hummingbirds. And the lobelia, every hummingbird garden should have lobelia in it. We believe that uh, our bee lawn work fits into a larger pattern of landscape restoration that includes first and foremost going organic and then the bee lawns which then lead the way into veggie gardens then pollinator pocket gardens prairie meadows food forests and then love forests and we have uh, i'm running out of time up here but we have youtube videos up that explain all of those different types of landscapes my name is Russ Henry, and I am the president of Minnehaha Falls Landscape. It's been my honor to be here with you today. We've got some free literature back there by Kari. Wave your hand back there. Feel free to stop over and grab a soil health handbook. And I'll be back at the back if you'd like to stop and talk. Thanks again, and have a great show.